Our journey begins 135 million years ago in the Jurassic period when the plant reproduction was far from easy. To put it simply, when plants needed to reproduce, a male plant would release pollen into the air and hope that the wind would pollinate the plants in close by areas. In reality, this was inefficient and most pollen was wasted. As a result, surrounding insects began to feed on the protein-rich pollen that would unknowingly carry pollen from other plants in the process. Natural selection soon proved that getting insects to transfer their pollen was a competition, and certain adaptations of some plants brought more pollination and thus more of a particular species. As early wasps were transferring pollen and were attracted to sweet liquid inside flowers, they were encouraged to adapt so that pollen could easily stick to their bodies. Consequently, the modern-day European honeybee, Apis mellifera, came to be, no pun intended, and it even gets stickier from there. In this clip, a worker bee is seen foraging close to her hive. This female bee will carry her nectar, stored in a separate honey stomach, back to the hive and it will be passed off to another worker. Nectar is about 60% water and 40% glucose, but a fanning process reverses this ratio to produce honey. For bees, it takes the energy from one ounce of honey to fuel the flight around the world, and honey is surprisingly nutritious. The males in the hive have one purpose in life to mate with the queen from another hive to ensure genetic diversity. A male will die after the mating process, but a queen will only have to go on one mating flight to lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. The genetics behind bee sex are fascinating. Male bees, called drones, hatch from unfertilized eggs. In humans, we have diploid cells and half of our chromosomes are from each parent. In bees, females have 32 chromosomes, 16 from the queen and 16 from a drone. Males have only 16, making drones haploid. A male bee is differentiated from a female bee depending on a gene called Complementary de Sex Determiner, or CSD. A bee requires two different copies of this gene to create a girl, but only one to make a boy. If a bee has two different copies, this turns into a working protein, which in turn helps to create a protein called Feminizer. This helps to develop girl bee anatomy as well as a protein called Double Sex. Double Sex directs production of all female genes, an important aspect of worker bee anatomy. If there aren't two different copies of CSD, a dysfunctional feminizer is made, creating a male-specific double sex. This helps to make male characteristics. While bee genetics are complex, advancements in technology are allowing for further development of selective breeding techniques for certain traits. Development of knowledge about these traits that control hygienic behavior has led to many scientific studies about effects of different genes on a honeybee colony. One specific gene that has been studied recently is called Varroa Sensitive Hygiene, or VSH. The effect of this VSH is that it triggers behaviors that help to control the hygiene and the mite levels within a hive, such as grooming of other bees. Scientists Dr. John Harbo and Dr. Jeffrey Harris have been working on breeding bees with higher levels of VSH within the hive, as this is a gene that we have recognized to help with controlling one of the largest threats to honeybees, the Varroa mite. The result of this it was a queen who would produce offspring containing VSH, but the queen would produce a poor brood pattern after a few months of laying. After further research, the poor brood pattern was not a sex allele problem, because the queen started off with a strong pattern. It was just after a few months that the VSH heavy colony's brood would deteriorate. Like many projects, the cause for this poor brood pattern is still unknown. In order to gather more data on the effects of the VSH gene in a colony, a study published comparative performance of two mite-resistant stocks of honeybees in Alabama beekeeping operations by Ward and Donka was released in 2008. The scientists compared mite levels in a control hive, a hybrid VSH hive, and a pure VSH hive. The study resulted in 12% of the pure VSH hive reaching a need treatment threshold, 24% of the hybrids reached the threshold, and 40% of control reached the threshold. Effects of VSH show that VSH decreases mite levels, but the negative impact on the hives are still being worked out. Similar to the study involving VSH, Russian honeybees have historically been exposed to Varroa destructor the longest, and thus were hypothesized to have the greatest natural selection and resistance to the mite naturally. A study conducted by Robert G. Donka exposed Russian honeybees to Varroa and evaluated for mite population growth. Most had a mite population growth that was half to one-tenth of the standard European honeybee, with one colony not showing any mite population growth at all. Further research is happening as the fight against Varroa mites continues, trying to understand how to control one of the greatest threats to beehives today. Much of our food supply requires pollination. To name a few, you might be familiar with avocados, soybeans, asparagus, broccoli, celery, squash, sunflowers, 
for oil, cucumbers, citrus fruits, peaches, kiwis, cherries, cranberries, and melons. Bees are responsible for one-sixth of plant species worldwide and about 400 different agricultural types of plants. Because of this, honeybees help feed 90% of the world and $30 million in crops. As bees become more threatened, we lose more plants that bees pollinate. All of the animals that eat those plants and all of the crops that humans eat will not be produced as much. Sustainable ecosystems depend on the producers to fuel their food chain, and the producers can't thrive without bees. After watching this, go home and plant some flowers. Get rid of those pesticides and support your local beekeeper. The time to start has passed, but any move forward will be a positive one.